Thank you. What, are you done? <laughs> Thank you, it's great to be here. You know, Rick mentioned uh, last night that uh, he was baptizing after the four o'clock service. He baptized 153 people last night, just after the four o'clock service. Isn't that awesome? 153 people, yeah, that's worth clapping about. And we'll be baptizing at the end of this service too. Uh, not, not Rick, but somebody else will. And uh, we'd love to baptize you if you'd like to be baptized. We are, as Rick said, we're in the second week on the, this series on the life of Jesus where we're, we're looking at his life, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, we're looking at it through the lens of some filmmakers, uh, the people who produced the movie, The Son of God. And this week, what I wanna talk about is what I've titled The God of Second Chances. Because as you look at so many people in scripture, so many of the heroes in the Bible, they actually had pretty sketchy, scandalous histories. You look at Peter, for example. Peter, the great man that we you know, read about in scripture all the time, and yet, remember, he's the guy who denied that he knew Jesus three times. When Jesus needed him the most, he denied that he even knew him, and yet Jesus gave him a second chance, and Peter went on to help build the church. The Apostle Paul. Paul was a man who not only persecuted Christians, he participated in their execution. And yet God gave Paul a second chance. And Paul went on to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ over most of the known world at that time and also then wrote about half of the New Testament. We look in the Old Testament. There's, for example, there's a woman named Rahab. Rahab, as many of you know, was a prostitute. And yet God gave her a second chance and she went on to become the great-great-grandmother of King David. David himself. David was an adulterer, committed adultery with the wife of a very close friend of his. And then to cover all of it up, he had his friend murdered. And yet God gave David a second chance. He said, that man, that adulterer, that murderer, no, he's a man after my own heart. And God gave him a second chance. And we see over and over throughout scripture that God is a God of second chances. Today we're looking at another second chance story. We're looking at a man named Matthew. Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples. He was one of the apostles. He's one of the big guys that we like to read about in scripture. But Matthew had a scandalous history. He had a very questionable character. And his story is what I want to focus on. His story is a story of amazing grace. His story is a story of the scandalous love of God. But before we get into Matthew's story, I want to ask you about your story. Because you know, when we come to the Word of God, many of you have heard me say before <clears throat> that the Bible doesn't only tell us the things that God did, the Bible tells us how he does things. It doesn't just tell us the things God said, it tells us how he thinks. And the Bible is not simply an historical book. The Bible is an eternal book. And there is eternal truth in these pages. So when you come to an historical passage, like the story of Matthew, you're always looking for the eternal truth. The question is always, how does this apply to my life? Lord, what are you trying to say to me? This example of Matthew, how does this apply to me today? So I want to start by looking at your story before we go to Matthew's story. And I want to, I want to ask you a couple of questions. What does God think of you? What is God's opinion of you? When God sees you, does he only see your past or does he dream about your future? Does he just shake his head at all the mistakes you've made and all of the things you've done? Or does he delight in who he is making you to be moment by moment, step by step, day by day, more and more into the image of Jesus Christ? How you answer those questions will have a profound impact on how you see yourself and how you see God and how you will see the rest of the world. 
You know, I think a lot of us come to church hoping that maybe we'll hear something from God. Maybe there's a, a crisis, some dilemma that we're going on in our life, and we, we're hoping that maybe God might have something to say to us. I think some of us come to church just so maybe we can check it off of a religious to-do list. We come out of duty, out of obligation. Well, my grandfather went to church and my father went to church, so I go to church too. Some of us come to church just hoping God might notice we were there. So we get some sort of credit that we can cash in on later on. It's sort of like attending class is half of the grade. Some people come to church out of curiosity. They want to know who is Jesus and what are all these people talking about. Some people come to church to, to really worship the Lord and to, to be with God's people. Regardless of the reason that you're here in this service, I believe that you're here because God brought you here today. You may have driven the car, but that doesn't mean it was your idea. God brought you here today because God wants to say something to you. And I believe that what he wants to say to you, first and foremost, what he wants you to know, is how deeply you are loved by him. How much he loves you, how much he cares about you, that God sees you, that he understands you, that he knows you. God did not bring you here today to scold you. He didn't bring you here to make you feel bad about yourself. He brought you here because he wants you to know that he loves you. And no matter who you are, no matter what you have done, he cares about your life, he has a plan for your life, he has a purpose for your life, and he is a God of second chances. No matter how many second chances you might need, he's never short of a second chance again. So we're looking at the story of a man named Matthew, a man who got a second chance from Jesus. The Bible doesn't actually say a whole lot about Matthew, but if we study what it does say, we actually find that it tells us quite a bit about him. For instance, we know that Matthew was a tax collector. We also know that Matthew was Jewish. The problem you have there is that you have a Jewish man working for the Roman government. Tax collectors in those days were the most hated people in all of society. You think the IRS guys have it bad now. The tax collectors in those days were the most hated people in their society. Because to the rest of the Jews, a tax collector was a sellout. He was a traitor. He was a man who was making his money off of the sweat of his own people. You see, the way a tax collector made his money from the Romans, he didn't get a salary. It was sort of like buying, buying a, a, a franchise. The tax collector would go to the Romans and say, I can guarantee you that I will collect and deliver a certain amount of tax money from these people. Now the Romans didn't care how much he actually collected as long as he delivered on what he promised. So a tax collector could then, just out of his own whim, place any kind of assessment that he wanted to on property or on goods. He could charge a tax based on whatever value he wanted to place on other people's goods. And as long as he gave the Romans what they were looking for, well, they didn't care how much he kept on top of that. So the more he could get out of somebody, the richer a tax collector would become. Matthew was no peasant. Matthew was a wealthy man, as we're going to see as this story develops. But because of the way tax collectors went about their business, their own people hated them because they were working for the Romans. And the Romans hated them because they were Jewish. So the only friends that a tax collector would have were other tax collectors. In their society, a tax collector's testimony was not even permitted to be entered into a court of law because nobody trusted these guys. Their reputation was that they were liars, that they only lived for themselves. And as I, as I thought about Matthew, I thought, what in the world would lead a guy to take on that kind of a job as his career, knowing how other people were going to see him? Well, surely there must have been a love of money that maybe was only second to the love of himself. There had to have been a hardened heart, 
a calloused disregard for his own people. And there was probably some level of hopelessness. We are being governed by the Romans, by our enemies. I don't see any change coming. I may as well just get whatever I can out of this system while I can get it out of this system, and I really don't care what other people think. That had to have been going on in Matthew's, Matthew's life. And of course, he also had the, the uh, Roman soldiers to be his, his enforcers, so there's nothing anybody could do to stop him from doing what he was doing. But in spite of all of this money that Matthew was making in his job, Matthew was spiritually bankrupt because he had been told, as all of people in their culture were told, that a tax collector could never go to synagogue. It would be like saying that a tax collector can't come to church. He wasn't allowed to come to church because God would not allow him in the place. A tax collector was told that his prayers would never be listened to, let alone answered by God. Tax collectors were told that they had absolutely no hope of ever receiving any kind of favor or mercy from God. No matter what they did to try to make things right, there was nothing they could do to ever be made right before God. Their case was closed. It was hopeless for a tax collector. There was nothing they could, they were beyond redemption. And I can imagine it must have been in Matthew's mind that when it came to things about God and faith, he must have thought, it's too late for me. There's nothing I can do to make things different. I have no chance at all of heaven. I might as well get everything I can on the earth while I'm here because when this is over, literally, there will be hell to pay. So that's Matthew. That's his background. That's the life that he's living. His only friends are people that are just like him, and everybody else hates him. But one day, Jesus stepped into Matthew's life, and with just two words, two words, he changed everything about Matthew. And we're gonna look at those two words today. There are a lot of lessons that we can learn from Matthew's encounter that he had with Jesus. Lessons that not only tell us what happened to him, but as I said, it also tells us how God does things with us too. So I want you to write some things down in your notes. Here's the first thing you can write down, is just as, just as Jesus saw Matthew, write this down, Jesus sees me as I am. Jesus sees me as I am. Now, Matthew was not looking for Jesus on this particular day because he knew he didn't deserve Jesus' attention. He knew who Jesus was. Jesus had been preaching and performing miracles in his own town. So he knew who Jesus was. The word had spread pretty quickly. But he didn't go looking for Jesus. But Jesus came looking for Matthew. Here's what the Bible says. Look at this first verse in your outline. Matthew 9, 9. It says, as Jesus went on from there, let me tell you where there is. Remember the story when four guys were trying to get their friend to Jesus so he could be healed and they cut a hole in the roof and dropped the guy down in front of Jesus? That's there. That's what he's talking about. The guy has just been healed. Jesus has just healed that man. And it says now, so as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man. I want everybody to say the word saw. Yeah, say it again, saw. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, there's the two words. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's only one verse. Jesus saw him, he said, follow me. Matthew got up and he followed him. But there's actually some profound truth just in those words if you stop and study them and think about them long enough. Because when the Bible says that Jesus saw Matthew, it doesn't mean that it was just a casual glance. What it actually means is that he turned his attention to him, he perceived him, he understood him. It's sort of like when somebody is trying to explain something to you and you finally get it and you say, oh, I see. It's that kind of seeing. 
Jesus saw Matthew. Jesus understood Matthew. He understood his story. He understood his life. He understood what it was like to be Matthew. He understood how other people perceived Matthew. He understood how Matthew perceived himself. And just like Jesus saw Matthew, Jesus sees you too. He understands you. He knows you. He gets you. He sees you. Now I want us to watch the scene from the movie Son of God and see how they portrayed this. They brought some various pieces together into the story, but it's a wonderful way they, they produce this encounter that Matthew has with Jesus. Let's watch this. Stinking vermin. You should keep your distance from them. Two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other one a tax collector. The Pharisee prayed, God. I thank you that I'm not like other men, thieves, adulterers, or this tax collector. But the tax collector didn't even look up to heaven. He said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. God bless the tax collector, not the Pharisee. Anyone who praises himself for be humbled, and anyone who humbles himself will be praised. Matthew, come. See, now he even calls the sinners to follow him. One has to wonder of the sins committed by his other followers. Tax collectors. There's not a thread of good in any of them. Thomas, Jesus has not come for the good, but for the sinners. He gives people a second chance. We should too. That's my favorite scene in the movie. Because you think about who Matthew went on to become. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But I love what I have Mary Magdalene say at the end of that scene. She says, Jesus gives people a second chance. And we should too. Jesus saw Matthew just as he was. And Jesus sees me as I am. Now here's the second lesson we can learn. Not only does Jesus see me as I am, but Jesus loves me as I am. Jesus loves me as I am. Jesus came to Matthew where he worked, while he was working, while he was hurting people, and he loved him. No other rabbi in that day, no other religious person of that time would have risked his own reputation, the scandal of being a friend of a tax collector 
No one else would do something like that. But that was the way of Jesus. And what it tells me is that Jesus is not afraid of sinners. He loves them. And he loves them just the way they are. Now, let me go on to the rest of this story. Picking up at verse 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners, you see that phrase, tax collectors and sinners. You see those two words together all throughout, or three words, all throughout the Gospels. They sort of lump them together all the time. Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, why were they so shocked at what Jesus was doing? It's because in their culture, similar to ours, to have a meal with somebody represents friendship, it represents acceptance, and it represents love. So how could this holy man, Jesus, be showing friendship and acceptance and love to someone who was unclean like a tax collector. Tax collectors, according to the Jewish leaders, were as unclean as pigs. So to be eating a meal with a tax collector, Jesus might as well have been eating pork chops. This is wrong, what he is doing. But as I thought about the, the, the progress of this story, because I haven't left any verses out, it, it seemed almost kind of funny to me. Because it says, Jesus sees Matthew, he says, follow me. And the very next thing it says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. So where did Jesus lead Matthew? Back to his own house for dinner. It'd be sort of like if Jesus had said, Matthew, follow me. And Matthew says, where are we going? And Jesus says, oh, I don't know, I'm kind of hungry. Let's go to your house. You got anything to eat? And I thought, that sounds like something Rick would do. <laughs> so he leads Matthew back to Matthew's own house. Matthew, as Luke tells us, put on a great banquet, he called it, this huge meal, and invited all of his tax collector and sinner friends to come and meet Jesus, this guy who had now become his friend. So Jesus was caught partying with the wrong crowd. It was a scandal to the religious leaders. But Jesus sees me as I am, and he loves me as I am. And now here's a third lesson that we learn, is that Jesus calls me as I am. Jesus calls me as I am. He didn't tell Matthew to change anything about himself. He just said, come on, follow me. In fact, look at the next verse. The Bible says, on hearing this, this being the complaint of the Pharisees, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, he said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, I've come to call sinners. So when Jesus says, go and learn what this means, I thought, well, I should go and learn what it means. And what you find is that Jesus is actually quoting a passage from the Old Testament. He's quoting a part of a verse from the book of Hosea. Now remember, he's talking to the Pharisees, religious guys. So in a sense, you could say Jesus was speaking in shorthand. They knew the rest of the story behind the phrase, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. It's sort of like in your house or with your friends when somebody just repeats the punchline of a joke and you know the rest of the story that makes it meaningful, though this is no joke, the Pharisees knew the rest of this story behind that phrase. They knew, they understood that Jesus was rebuking them for merciless, heartless religion. We're gonna look at what it says in the book of Hosea. It's here on the screen. In the context that we see, God is talking to religious hypocrites, and here's what he says. Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. 
For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I desire acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. When he says, I desire mercy, here's what mercy is. Mercy means loving kindness, good-heartedness, and an attitude of love towards someone in a pitiful condition. He says, that's what I'm looking for. Loving kindness, good-heartedness, and an attitude of love towards someone who is in a pitiful condition. Matthew was in a pitiful state. As cruel and as mean as he was, his life was pitiful. When you think of what he had become, what he allowed himself to become. And when God says, I desire acknowledgement of God, that doesn't just mean sort of a tipping of the hat. Well, yeah, I see you. It's not that kind of acknowledgement. What it means is, I want you to know me personally and experientially, not just in theory. So in other words, what God is saying in that passage and what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees is that I don't want your religion. I want you to love people, and I want you to love me. I don't want your rules. I want a relationship. And that's what Jesus called Matthew to. Jesus did not call Matthew to a code of behavior. Jesus did not call Matthew to a list of rules and do's and don'ts. Jesus called Matthew to himself. Jesus didn't call Matthew to a religion. He called him to a friendship. He said, follow me. He didn't say follow this list of rules, follow these laws. He said, follow me. Jesus sees me as I am. Jesus loves me as I am. Jesus calls me as I am. But here's the fourth point, and it's really important. Jesus won't leave me as I am. He won't leave me as I am. His invitation to Matthew was immediate. It was instant. And there were no conditions to it. It was mercy. He didn't make Matthew jump through a bunch of hoops before he could be his follower. He didn't make Matthew change his life before he could be his follower. He didn't make Matthew correct anything about himself. He didn't stare him down. He didn't shame him. Jesus didn't say, what in the world are you doing? What is the matter with you? What are you thinking? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Jesus didn't say any of those things. He just said, follow me. And then Jesus changed Matthew's life. He said, follow me, and we'll figure out all the rest of this as we go. It was an invitation to friendship to an utterly undeserving man in a pitiful condition. It was mercy, inviting him to a personal friendship. And the Bible says that Matthew followed immediately. The call to Matthew was a picture of God's grace. And that same grace is available to every person in this room today. Jesus says to you, just like he said to Matthew, follow me and we'll get you out of the mess that you're in. Follow me and I'll give you a whole new life. Jesus called Matthew before he had done anything at all to deserve it. It was the grace of God, and it is the grace of God that saves you. It is the grace of God that enables you to make the changes that need to happen in your life. It is the grace of God that turned Matthew from a sinner into a saint. And it is that same grace of God that will change everything about you and that will give you a second chance. And God is the one who will do it in you and for you. You don't have to do it ahead of time. Look at this wonderful promise from the book of Philippians in chapter one, where the Bible says that he who began the good work in you. Notice it doesn't say that you began the good work in you. It says he who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion. And Ephesians chapter two, it says, for it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not by works, so that nobody can boast about it. 
I love the way it says it in the New Living Translation. Look at it. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Let me say that again. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. You see, in other religions, you have to stop sinning in order to be saved. But in the way of Christ, you have to be saved in order to stop sinning. In other religions, salvation and forgiveness and the hope of heaven are the final step, the final accomplishment, the final attainment as you climb your way up your own little stairway to heaven. But in the way of Christ, salvation and forgiveness, those are the first step. What everybody else has to work for to try to attain, God just starts you right there and says, here, it's a gift to you. Now let me show you how to walk in it. God's greatest gifts to us, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, salvation itself, his greatest gifts to us are not up on a top shelf where only a few special goody two-shoes religious people can somehow hope to reach that highest level. God's greatest gifts to you his grace and mercy and forgiveness and salvation, his greatest gifts are on the bottom shelf. And the only way to reach them is to get on your knees. You cannot earn God's forgiveness. You cannot deserve God's forgiveness. You can't buy his forgiveness. No matter how generous you are, it's not gonna buy God's forgiveness. You cannot behave your way, be good enough, long enough to finally, God says, okay, you've done enough good things, I'll let all these other things go. Let me let you in on a little secret. And this might sound kind of weird coming from a pastor, but I'm a weird pastor, so get over it. <laughs> good people do not go to heaven. That's what I said. Good people do not go to heaven. Forgiven people do. You can be as good as you want to be, but until you've been forgiven by God, you don't have a chance. You can think you've been behaving yourself, but you know what? I'm probably aware of maybe, at the most, 1% of my sin. It's only through forgiveness. And the only way to get God's forgiveness is to surrender to it, to receive it, to accept the gift of his grace, to take Jesus up on his invitation to you to follow me. He says, just follow me, and we'll take care of all of those other things. Luke tells us, when he tells this story, that without a moment's hesitation, he says, Matthew got up, left everything, and followed Jesus. He left everything. He responded immediately. Now you gotta think about what Matthew was leaving when he did that. Matthew knew that he was taking an enormous risk because he could never go back to his old life. He couldn't say, you know, if this thing with Jesus doesn't work out, I can go back to the Romans and get my job back as a tax collector. Well, no, he couldn't because he had just abandoned his post. He left everything sitting there, all the money, the books, everything, just left it, got up, and left. So the Romans were not gonna give him his job back. They're probably looking for him. And no other Jewish people would give him anything either, not after everything he had done to them. So Matthew is all in. He's completely committed. He's completely surrendered to what's going on here. And that speaks to me of a man who was desperate for a relationship with God. Speaks to me of a man who was desperate for acceptance and love and friendship. And of a man who had been told by a religious system that it is too late for you. 
You have gone too far. You've made too many mistakes. You are too unclean for God. It is hopeless. The case is closed. It's over. That's what Matthew believed. And so at the first chance to get a second chance, Matthew jumped at it instantly. He responded to it. And the Bible says that he left everything. Now what else was he leaving besides his job? Well, he left his guilt. He left his shame. He left his unkindness. He left his sins. He left his past. He left all of the things about his life that he hated. And he stepped into a whole new life. Now what about you? Jesus has given the same invitation to you. Follow me. Have you taken him up on his invitation? He didn't have to ask Matthew twice. It only took once. And Matthew was all in. And he stepped into that new life. Now what was the outcome of Matthew's decision that day? Well, we know he became a follower of Jesus. And Matthew went on to write what is arguably the most read book in the Bible. With the possible exception of Genesis and Psalms, Matthew is probably the most read book in the Bible because most people start in the New Testament. Matthew is the beginning of the New Testament. But I'm so glad that Matthew wrote the Gospel of Matthew. And by the way, if you have never read the Gospel of Matthew, when you leave here tonight, you should go home and read Matthew. It's awesome. I have to warn you, the first 17 verses are like reading out of a phone book. It's just a list of names. So skip them. Go ahead, skip them. You can come back to them some other time. Skip them, because starting at verse 18 through the rest of Matthew's book, and it's just a little short thing, but through the rest of his book, the story of Jesus unfolds before you. It's absolutely magnificent. His teachings, his, his sermons, his miracles, his death and resurrection, his ascension, all of that you find in the Gospel of Matthew. And there are some things that Matthew wrote down in his Gospel that the other three writers did not write down. And when you look at those things, you have to say, what was it about those things that was so special to Matthew that he thought, the other guys may not have got these, but I'm, I got this one. I wrote this one down. For example, Matthew gave us Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed. Remember the story about the man who's sowing seed on hard soil and on rocky soil and on soft soil, and it's a picture of how we receive the word of God in our lives. Matthew was the one who wrote down Jesus' parable of the wise and foolish builders, that it's the wise builder who builds his life on the word of God. Matthew was the one who wrote down the parable of the unmerciful servant. Matthew was the one who wrote down the parable of the pearl, pearl of great price. Matthew is the one, Matthew, the tax collector, this guy with this horrible past, Matthew's the guy who gave us the Lord's Prayer. Aren't you grateful for that? Something that many of us have been praying since we were little kids. In fact, I want us to pray it together right now. We're going to put the words on the screen, and we're just going to pray the prayer out loud together. You ready? Where are the words? Get them up there. Here we go. You ready? Let's pray it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Matthew, the tax collector, is the one who wrote that prayer down. Matthew, is the one who gave us the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon in all of history. When Jesus preached that sermon, the sermon that begins with what's called the Beatitudes, the first line, think of what this meant to Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of God. If anybody ever understood what it meant to be poor in spirit, it was Matthew, because he was spiritually bankrupt. Matthew was the one who wrote down these words in Matthew chapter six about worry, when Jesus said, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Matthew is the one who wrote down Jesus' words about you. Everybody's sitting right here in these seats, in this room right now. When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world, Matthew was the one who wrote down Jesus' great commission right before he ascended into heaven, the commission that he gave that we have built the whole peace plan on. Look at these words. It's only in Matthew, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and you make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And it is Matthew who gave us some of the most comforting words in all of scripture. In Matthew chapter 11, when Jesus said this, come to me, come to me, follow me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That is an invitation to you right now. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Is anybody here weary and burdened? Are you carrying stuff around with you, stuff in your memories, things that you've done, guilt, shame, whatever it is, are you carrying a burden that you would love to get rid of and you need some rest for your soul? Jesus gives you that invitation right now to come to him, follow him. Everybody else saw Matthew and they saw his past. But Jesus saw Matthew and he saw who he would become. Everybody else saw Matthew's failures, but Jesus saw Matthew's future. A disciple, an apostle, a spiritual giant, and a messenger from God who would write down a message that would change the world. Jesus met Matthew just the way he was. He saw him as he was, he loved him as he was, he called him as he was, but he didn't leave him as he was. He changed everything about Matthew's life. Now let me go back to the questions I started the message with. Now that we know about Matthew, who he was and who he became, and how Jesus saw him, let me ask you, what does God think of you? What is his opinion of you? When God sees you like Jesus saw Matthew, and by the way, God does. He knows everything about you. He perceives you. He understands you. He gets you. When God sees you, does he only think about your past? Or does he dream about your future? How you answer those questions will profoundly impact the way you see God and the way you see yourself. So let me ask you, how do you see yourself? Do you think that you are beyond God's mercy? You listen to the story about Matthew and you think, man, compared to my life, Matthew was a Girl Scout. When you think about all the things I've done and all the places I've been and all the stuff that's gone on in my life, Matthew got nothing on me. Matthew may have got a second chance. I'm beyond the second chance. I tried my second chance. I tried a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance. I'm out of chances. It's over. 
There's no way that God could forgive me again, that God could call me into anything at all, that God could use me for anything at all. It is hopeless for me. Do you really think that you could exhaust God's patience? Do you really think that you could exhaust God's mercy? If you think that you have gone too far and that you are now somehow unforgivable because of something you did when you were a child, a teenager, an adult, last month or last night or even today, and you think I've gone too far, I am unforgivable, then what you're saying is that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, his death and his resurrection was insufficient, that it fell short of what it was intended to accomplish, that it might be good for everybody else, but when it came to your case, God screwed up. He fell short when it came to your sins. But here's what the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So let me ask you, what is the worst thing that you have ever done? Do you think it's a surprise to God? Do you think God is in heaven going, oh my goodness, I had no idea that was coming. I've never seen anything like that one before. I guess we messed up. Do you really think that God doesn't know? And yet he says to you, just like he said to Matthew, follow me. Nobody is beyond God's reach. Nobody is beyond God's forgiveness. The most famous verse in the Bible, the one that we have all heard so many times that I think sometimes we don't even hear it anymore, is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, that whoever believes believes in him. Are there any whoever's here in the building? Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You say, yeah, but what about my past? Whoever believes in him. What about my drug addiction? What about my alcoholism? Whoever believes in him. What about my crimes? Whoever believes in him. What about the things that I have done to hurt other people? Whoever believes in him, shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. The only person in the world who can allow your sin to come and stand and create a barrier between you and God is you. Quit trying to talk God out of his mercy. Just receive it. Stop trying to talk God out of grace. Just receive it. Stop trying to come up with some other plan for God and say, God, I got a better idea. If I do all of these nice things, no. Just receive it. It's God's plan. He knows what is best for you. Jesus has come to meet you here today and to offer his grace to you today. And it is only God's grace that will save you. It is only God's grace that will change your life and give you a new start. He is a God of second chances. And Jesus has come to you today and he sees you just as you are and he loves you just as you are and he's calling you, follow me just as you are but he's not gonna leave you just as you are. He's saying, come to me. Any of you, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
It's an invitation to a second chance. It is an invitation to step into a whole new life. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become, not will become, has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So stop living the old life and step into the new life that the Lord has for you. Matthew shows us that there is no man or woman that is beyond God's forgiveness. And it shows us that there is no forgiven man or woman, regardless of their past, there is no forgiven man or woman that God cannot use for his glory. Let's bow in prayer together. Talk to the Lord about this. And as I pray, why don't you let my prayer become your prayer? And just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you today for your mercy. And I thank you for your grace. I thank you for Matthew's story and what it shows me about how you see me too. I thank you that you see me, you know me, you understand me, you get me just as I am. Thank you. And I thank you that you love me just as I am. And I thank you that you call me just as I am. But Lord, I thank you that you won't leave me just as I am. That you have a whole new life planned for me. And if you have never opened your life to Christ before, if this message is speaking to you about things going on in your heart, or maybe you have taken God up on his offer and you have somehow wandered away and you think maybe I'm too lost now, you can let this prayer be your prayer right now. Just say, Lord, just like Matthew came out from behind that table, I'm coming out from behind my sin today and I'm choosing to follow you. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins, to give me a new heart, to give me a new life, to teach me how to follow you. Teach me how to live a life that pleases you. Lord Jesus Christ, I receive you today as my Savior. And I thank you. And I pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.